Welcome to Demand Gen Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, CEO of Caspian Studios. We are brought to you by our friends at Qualified. Qualified is the number one conversational sales and marketing platform for your company's revenue teams that use Salesforce. Head over to qualified.com to learn more. And today, we are joined by a very special guest. Grant, how are you? I'm doing great. Nice to talk with you, Ian. Yeah, great to be talking again. Really excited to hear about your new role, new company, and all that. Can you tell us a little bit about this new company that you, I guess not just, but relatively recently, just started at Build Trust? I am a relative newbie. I went to join the first of this year, so about three months. And I was fortunate to join the Sales Achievement Club and meet a lot of the high performing sales folks and a bill trust is a b2b accounts receivable or otherwise you know it's ar automation and digital payments market leader and in layman's terms basically what we do is we help businesses get paid faster improve their cash flow and reduce cost all good things in this economy i think <laughs> there's nothing that i loathe more than than working on ar it's perhaps one of my least favorite things on this planet yeah, I and mean, a lot of people, I think, feel the same way. And if we can make that job less frustrating and free up some time to do more exciting things, then we're happy and hopefully our customers are happier. Grant, gosh, you came on DGV episode 28, and now we are 100 episodes later having you back. So it's excited to chat about this new chapter here at Bill Trust. Let's get into our first segment, The Trust Tree where we go and feel honest and trusted and you can share those deepest, darkest demand gen and marketing secrets. Who does Bill Trust serve? What is the persona that you're selling into and the companies? Yeah, it's really the office of the CFO and they come by a lot of titles. We have, like many companies, various personas. So certainly the CFO in some companies, it could be the controller or the VP of finance. It might be the AR manager, maybe even the treasurer as well as some more specific functions like credit director or collections manager. Since we're helping companies get paid, there's different titles associated with making sure that customers are paid in a timely fashion, and we help with that entire process. And so digging into those types of companies and size of companies, how do you think about segmenting that market? Yeah, that's a really timely question because we are going through what we call a TAM total available market and ICP, ideal customer profile, refinement. Bill Trust went from private to public, did an IPO a few years ago, was taken private again by EQT based in Europe, near $100 billion in assets, really successful company. And as they had closed that transaction in the last year, I joined the first of this year. We have historical success in both mid-market and enterprise. And in particular, I'll just share a few of the segments that we have a lot of customers in heavy machinery, for example, manufacturing, medical equipment, business services, technology, transportation. If you think about it at a high level, if you're a business that has a lot of customers and you want to make sure that your customers not only pay you in a timely fashion, but they're happy with the way you invoice them, having visibility into what's owed, did you deliver the good or the service or both, Bill Trust helps make that happen. And we work for companies, I'll just use some alliteration, like examples of some of these Chiquita Brands, Caterpillar, St. Gobain, and CDW. You know, some of these companies are pretty large, but we also help smaller companies across mid-market up through a large enterprise. And how do you organize your team to go after those accounts? We have segment-based teams. So we have teams focused on segments such as mid-market. We have segments, the larger enterprise we have a vertical teams. So I mentioned we have specific verticals, sales folks that have industry knowledge, what I would call domain expertise. They speak the language. They know the drivers, the important hot topics for those industries. And so from a marketing perspective, I have dedicated folks that support both the verticals as well as the product offerings by segment. And we work hand in hand. I believe go to market is a connected motion when it works well. So the, the BDRs, we call them ADRs, but you've heard ADR, SDR, BDR, they're the development reps, if you will. Together with marketing sales, we lock arms and decide on what are the best tactics, the programs, and the feedback loops 
so we can optimize our opportunity and gain new customers and grow existing ones. Any differences or changes or unique stuff with sort of the, your go-to-market and how you think about it at Build Trust? The fact that we are segmented, if I reflect on my career, this is my fifth tour of duty. Fifth stop is a tour as a CMO. Each company, you sort of learn a little bit. Certainly that's always been my goal is to find out, learn some new things. And the segmentation is really, I think, key. It's not that anyone today with all the digital tools and chat GPT and analytics and machine learning and all the things we have at our disposal is just going to do spray and pray or random acts of marketing. On the other hand, the fact that we know who our customers are, we know what the problems they have, we know who the personas decision makers are, it makes us much more intentional in our activities, whether it's a marketing activity, a sales activity, communications activity. So we, we tend to land better than if we just, let's see who responds. And so I found that because in past companies, if you just have a general business approach you're going to get some percentage response. Our response rates, while I can't disclose them, they are a bit higher than industry averages. It's such a good point about having this cornucopia of tools that allow us to do way more spray and pray marketing than we possibly could ever imagine. I talked to one of the a great recurring guests of the show, Chandar, always talks about you get to run three plays and that's it. And that's all you can focus on. And that's all you're allowed to do. Let's see how much you can do well. And I think about, I mean, I think about that every day, every single day when I look at our Q1 marketing goals and our Q2 marketing goals and all that stuff. And I think about that every day and I'm like, are we doing too many plays? Like, are we doing too many things? Are we boiling the ocean? But does that fit into here? And it's like, gosh, and like, yeah, the chat GPT thing or whatever it is, like, there's no silver bullet. It's another tool in the toolkit that uh, we can use. That's a really interesting point. I think Chandar is in one of my CMO peer groups, great guy. And the more prescriptive we can be, hopefully the more predictable we can become. And so I, mm -hmm. I did a blog on the 2023, the year of predictable marketing. That's part of my vision of where we can get to is we just leverage the tools. We have the right discipline and focus and execution. We can say, look, if we have another million dollars of pipeline marketing investment, we'll produce 10 million in revenue. And the board and my CEO says, we'll do that all day long. So that's what we're aiming for versus like, let's just try a bunch of different things and keep changing what we're doing. That's not a really good prescription for predictability. I like the idea. I don't, we have more than three sales plays, but it's not unlimited. It's very focused by segment, by informed by what's working and what's working best. Yeah. And, I, and we're going to get into the, to those plays here in a second. And I do want to shout out that your blog, cmomentor.com is great. And uh, everybody should check it out. We'll link it up in the show notes and have some really great, really, really fun stuff on there, including the post that you mentioned about predictable marketing. But yeah, I think that that's the goal, right? Is it seems like as you become more tenured in these, in the, as the fifth time around the sun of your CMO, CMO dem, figuring out how to be predictable is far more interesting than like hitting the home run that you don't know how it came from, why, where it came from, or why it came from. And obviously we always want to hit the home run too, but, but it's interesting that predictable is your goal. Yeah. I was fascinated a long time ago with the digital marketing. I, I remember I had a pretty big PPC budget and it was great to see that, but I'll tell you the most success I had, actually I'd, I'd been on the agency side at one point in my career where I ran Dell's direct advertising for North America. And it's a little different than SaaS fintech business that I'm in. We could provide Dell as their agency with 99% certainty on how much we get return on a dollar invested. I've always been fascinated by, can I replicate that in, this, in the more complex SaaS digital world? And for those who were born after the computer era blossomed, Dell, one of the leading direct marketers of all time, that you know they would sell millions and millions of computers through direct to consumer whether digital or TV or however they do it, but they didn't invest those dollars without knowing what the return is. And so that's sort of why that's the vision here. There's not an appeal to the bright, shiny object. There's really appeal to the better way of doing things, right? There's lots of, always lots of tools, but if it's going to have a better return and a better outcome, that's where I want to invest the incremental marketing dollar. And that was a good segue to, to get into those bets. But I will just add there that I think that so much of making bets 
we see this all the time with the series that we create where people so often want to say, let's just test, can we do four episodes? And I'm like, yeah, sure. You could do four episodes. What are some of your favorite podcasts or TV shows? And they're like, oh, this, this, and this. And I love the Mandalorian or I love you know, whatever. Like, do they have four episodes? Like, no. <laughs> like, yeah, because nobody makes things in groups four episodes, you know, unless it's like British television, you're making like hour and a half episodes or something like that. And then they do multiple seasons. I'm like, the point of, and I use the, the series stuff because I have these conversations every day, but there's so much of this experimentation, but without the backbone of committing to this is how this play works. And I think that with all of this, like the rise of experimentation, that people lack the conviction to say, this is something that I believe that the company needs for the long term. And to look at those campaigns to say, what does this look like in three years? Not that you need to run it for three years, but like, if I invest in this, what is real success look like year after year? And how do we build it to be consistent and repeatable. And so often it's like the exact opposite. It's just like, we tried this and it, that doesn't work. Like you hear people say, we tried video and it didn't work. You're like, what does that even mean? Like <laughs> there's a million things that video could mean. Right. How did you try it? It seems like you have a lot of conviction for the way that you invest in, in things. Yeah, I, I do. And I do agree that you have to commit to something. You can't declare it unsuccessful if you haven't given it a chance and tried a few tweaks. And after a certain period of time, you don't want to hit your head against the wall. You just, you let it go. But you're right. You've got to have the right longitudinal view of what it takes for a campaign to take hold and, and be successful. Let's get to the playbook where you open up that famous five times CMO grant playbook and tell us the tactics that help you win. You play to win the game. Hello. You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. What are your three channels or tactics that are your uncuttable budget items? Yeah, I guess I'd have to go back to the first episode. And congratulations, by the way, Ian and team with well over 100. That's You've got quite a series going. And that was one of the early guests. And this wasn't on my list before, but I have to say it's like right before COVID, early days and all things digital. But in particular, I'm still, even though I was early into it, I'm still a a PPC fan, it just has to get really creative and have good tracking mechanisms. But as long as you're getting acceptable rates and you have a diversified campaign, and often you have a partner helping you optimize your spend, that's good. It's funny, my last company, it didn't have a lot of success for webinars. I had it before. I've got, we're having a lot of success for webinars. And I think like a lot of things, you've got to put the effort into it. You've got to put, have the production quality compelling content, often guests, authorities that, you know, in the industry that you're marketing in, you have to do just like a physical thing, you know, pre-marketing during the event, have a good experience for the participants and post-event follow-up. It's a high source of leads that flow through into opportunities and closed one business. That's a, what I consider the true metric of successful market investment that a salesperson closed an actual customer. And the third, and maybe this is surprising, and I, I don't want to get a hundred emails about please come to this event, but you know, events work pretty well for us. And if you think about it, part of the reasons they do is that because we focus on a lot of verticals, they tend to have, you've heard of the term birds of a feather flock together. They have this sort of industry. You've got to go to this industry event and you can go to that event. And if you, again, you plan it well and you have a reasonable cost per lead, attendees are in the market, it can actually perform pretty well. So, well, we can't go to every event. And it's not even possible. There are certain events within certain segments that we find time and time again produce really good return. I loved, I came with this phrase a long time ago called intercept marketing, meaning you can also just have a really good booth presence and somebody doesn't know that Bill Trust is the best provider. And they walk by and say, hey, that looks interesting. Get paid faster. That's one of our marketing themes. I'd like to get paid faster. My customers are kind of slow at paying. How do I do that? Well, actually you can accept use credit card and we'll help with making sure that's easy for your customers to use. It gives them some float time, get paid faster. It's a win-win for you and your customers. And therefore, not only are you getting your cash in the door faster, they're happier doing business with you. That's one of the reasons why that events is now bubbled up into the uncuttable. I can't say which one, but events in general. 
it's funny to hear on the first time that you came on, you know, talking about paid search, paid social, and promotions on things like G2 and Captera. And then at this time around, that layering in webinars and events, which are two of the more old school demand gen tactics, quote unquote, old school tactics. But I think that what you're talking about is something that I've seen a lot of, which is people have worked back into their preferred way of learning. And there's, if you think of it as like people either, there's people, this is not really true, but there's people who brush their teeth every day and like to learn every day, or there's people who like to go to the dentist and get their teeth cleaned twice a year. And I think that you see a certain subset of the population really loves those in-person experiences. A certain set of the population loves those digital first, video first experiences in a webinar format where they kind of have to be there on at time and they can ask questions. People obviously like things like podcasts and video series where it's on demand. And I think that it's the blend of those different things of giving people options. That's what we're starting to see is that people are defaulting into those those ways. They've always been that way, but there's now a proliferation of digital tools and smaller events and micro events and digital events. And now the in-person stuff stands out even more because it actually is something where you can grab a beer and catch up with a long time friend. Yeah, it's the right, as you say, constructing the right marketing mix and multi-channels that optimize your opportunity to engage with prospects and customers. And yeah, you don't want to overinvest in one, but I think you're right now. Some of these other more traditional means, they found their way back into the mix. I think that the reason why they found their way back into the mix is because that's what people voted on. They wanted that stuff. They prefer it. And that's why it works, right? And you got to be listening to how your customer engages. I put a poll out the other day about webinars and I was like, when was the last time you went to a webinar? And there was a section of, because one of my employees was like, I've never been to a webinar. There's a section of a demographic of people that are of a certain age that straight up don't go to webinars. They've never been to webinars. It's never been part of their life, right? So if you're selling to that group and you roll out a solely webinar driven strategy, like you're going to be in tough shape and there's other groups that do, and it could be industry, it could be whatever. So anywho, fascinating. What about your most cuttable things or some stuff that maybe you're not investing in? A litmus test. I don't know if I tactic is, I'm just using the example. I, somebody said, hey, can we spend 10000 on this? It doesn't seem like a lot of money. Got budget in the millions and we're a good size company. Publicly reported before we went private. So can't report that, but Bill Trust was probably about a, you know, 165 million. It's before it went private. You know, approached a couple hundred million, good size company. And so 5000 or 10000 it's a crazy amount. But I ask anyone who wants to invest the dollar is, you need to model it out. What's the audience? What's the demographic? What personas are you reaching? Whatever methodology you use, are they a budget authority need, a timetable or some more packed? It doesn't really matter the methodology. You model out and I've had some of these folks come back and say, I don't know. I said, well, then discussion's over, right? You, it may not achieve that, but there's not an ROI. It's got to be at least three to one. Ideally, you'd be 10 to one ROI but at least has to be three to one ROI. And that's really the key thing. If it's not, we doesn't even get off the ground. And if we start looking at things, I always like at the end of the year, there's a good practice of looking at your marketing tech stack and your tools, as well as your programs. There's no entitlements. It's like, what's going to work mm -hmm. in 2023? I totally agree. If you had been that way, obviously with everything with COVID and then this, and then tech apocalypse and this and that, and like I say, every, everything that's been going on, it's like, goodness gracious, if you rolled out the same playbook and didn't adapt. It'd be tough. How do you view your website? I think it's essential. We were talking about some generations, they don't go to webinars and my kids, they don't open email, but I can text them, you know, or catch them on social yeah. media. You know, there's a lot of talk with ABM tools about the dark funnel and the website is your electronic presence. And so it has to do a lot of things. When I joined here, the individual who directs our web and digital had like a 65 page document. So we're replatforming and relaunching. So we have both a new platform that we're going to host on, and we have a whole new information architecture. You can now navigate, not just by product, you can navigate by your title, you can navigate by your industry. So we're trying to make it easier. I've always felt from the early days of the web to the current digital experience or platforms that yeah, you got a lot of metric. You want to lower your bounce rate and time on site and all your conversions. But in general, you just like any other brand impression, you want people to say, hey, I want to come back to that place. Remember the days when there were black websites and all kinds of crazy stuff. I think it's just an important part of your company and it has to serve all these stakeholders. 
at the end of the day, you want it to drive demand and build brand, but it also has to be, just be a pleasant experience. So I think I've always been very involved in web. In fact, when I find some extra time this week, I've, I've joined about 23 other testers before we go live with the new site. So sometime uh, early April, there'll be a new experience for a bill trust, but I'm going to go click on every link myself because I just think it's that important. I love it. Couldn't agree more. I do the same thing. One of the great lessons of my life, of my business life, was that you got to look through the lens because I did a video shoot and there was a mic in the shot. And the whole video shoot, I let the director do it and I didn't look in the lens. <laughs> it was like <laughs> literally a full day's worth of shoot. I was like, oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Don't, don't repeat that one, huh? <laughs> yeah, I saved up for you. But uh, any other things that you find especially interesting or things that you want to invest in, things that you're excited to try out, things that have blown your mind recently as a CMO, getting a fresh look at a new company? Yeah, and I think now everybody's doing it, but I remember before it was on national TV, I, and thank you for mentioning CMO Mentor. I, I do mentor other CMOs and you know write the blog, and I was like, what you know, what's this chat GPT thing and this is last year and it's like and I tried it out I was like I asked it like what are the seven most important things that determine success in a CMO or what are the seven essential things for a good digital campaign and since it synthesizes what's available out there it actually came up with what was pretty good I'm not afraid of it I think some folks are afraid of chat and bots and generative AI and all this stuff. It's like, it doesn't have the human element, obviously, and it doesn't have the creative element. And that's, if it can take the place of monotonous, manual, repetitive tasks, then I think it's great. I will tell you, uh, we're using it. There's a number of companies I know are making announcements, some of whom we adopted their technology, we might adopt their technology. And I think that's pretty exciting because if we can free up time to do more creative, impactful endeavors in our lives and in our work, then I think that's great. So that to me, that's why I say, and I mean it, that it's, I think it's the best time ever to be in marketing. I don't know there was a bad time, but there's a lot more at your disposal if you know how to leverage the tools to your advantage. Yeah, I'm not scared of it at all. We've actually been using AI copywriting for a while, pretty much since I started the company. Why wouldn't you? Like why? And it's funny, you know, we have conversations all the time where it's like, if that's happening, then couldn't that all just be replaced or this replaced or whatever? And I'm like, sure, could be, but someone's got to put the inputs in. Someone's got to figure out what to put there. Someone's got to come up with new ideas and new creative things. They have to get that stuff in market. It's not doing everything for you. If you're a copywriter and that's all you do, that might be a little challenging, but for the vast majority, marketers are pretty safe. Yeah, I think that you mentioned the big idea is still going to come from people, right? the repetitive, monotonous things that the first drafts and all the rest of that machine learning can produce, why not? More time for big ideas. Yeah. And if it, and if you can go back and spit a bunch of stuff that you've said into a thing and they can write a book for you in 10 minutes, that's pretty damn cool. If it's your own thoughts and ideas that it's regurgitating back into you, that's a lot better than going to a book publisher and having them help you. That's for sure. In terms of disruptive innovation, Clayton Christensen said it's exponentially better than nothing. I think ChatGPT fits the bill for that. All, all AI fits the bill for that. Like It's exponentially better than not having anything. So I just think it's an exciting time too. Are any other thoughts there? Any other thoughts that you wanted to touch on? No, I think you, you've really hit on what I think is going to help us move more towards predictable marketing when you can get bots and tools that help with the workload. And then, you know, you can free up some time for these impactful ideas. I, early in my career, I inherited a team that was real proud of all the leads they created and they were sort of activity focused. And I was always had been more outcome focused. I said, well, how much has been accepted by sales and what's converted and, and what's closed? And that's the ultimate success of a marketing organization. The company makes their number. You know, if we could have all these vanity metrics and the company has succeeded, there's not a lot to celebrate. So that's the other thing that this helps us align with sales and together achieve our you know shared goals, all the better. You and I talked last time about this, the ROI of everything and something that you focus on a ton. Obviously, we're in this sort of do more with less phase in technology that a lot of people have been talking about. That's a pretty terrible sort of phrase. To be honest, last time you talked about this idea of number of qualified leads times opportunity conversion, percentage of close rate, ACV, 
divided by cost. It's a pretty simple calculation, pretty powerful calculation, as many simple ones are. It's something that we use at Caspian as we're justifying ROI for creating a video series or a podcast series or something like that. Where does time fit on that equation? Yeah, I think time does. It takes too much time. You don't have you don't have time to experiment effectively. I don't know I put that into the math equation, but it's a really good observation. It, it's also related to the scale of the effort. It's a much larger multi-touch program, and you're going to have to give it time to prove out and what can you learn each step along the way. And sometimes there's one and done programs which work well. Webinar is a great example. And there's other you know, multi-touch different tactics that use. If you look at the what's called the buyer's journey, we're doing some analytics there to say like, how many touches does it take? What sort of content they consume? We've got various tools for that. What was the real catalyst? We became in the final three shootout and then ultimately the vendor of choice and uh, what got them over to our camp. And so again, the, the time is going to help you with that. And so I think that's a really good element to add to the equation. Yeah, I just, to me, it feels, it's so challenging because of seasonality with so much, especially, you know, budgets are cut now. Everybody's saying, okay, Q3, we're second half of the year. Hopefully budgets heat up a little bit or, hey, you know, our buying, so you got to talk to me in October and then we can budget it and get it going. But we know as marketers that if I'm talking to someone, if I get a lead in January and they're not going to close till next January, that the flash to bang on that is going to be really, it's going to be really long. We know that they're just no way they're going to buy, right? They do not have money. They can't find money from somewhere else, but that V that lead is just as powerful and it doesn't fit into the equation as something that, you know, Hey, if a campaign drives you a hundred leads and all of those or impacts a hundred accounts and all those accounts close a year from now, you might not last that long as a CMO if, if those mm-hmm. things don't start converting. Exactly. So I don't know how you navigate that. Any final thoughts here, Grant? No, I think we've covered a wide range of interesting topics. You know, one of the things you'd asked before, and I was thinking about it when I did the CMO mentors, I've mentored 12 individuals across my career who have become CMO. So I'm proud of that. And I, you know, I think the first time you're a CMO, I learned the hard way with mistakes I made and don't do it alone. Get a mentor, join a peer group talk to your your former boss or colleagues and just run some ideas by people before you make the mistake on your own. And I think that's probably the best advice I'd give to a first-time CMO. That's awesome. Okay, quit, some quick hits here. These are quick questions and quick answers. Just like how qualified.com helps companies generate pipeline faster, tap into your greatest asset, your website, and identify your most valuable visitors. Instantly start sales conversations, quick and easy, just like these questions. Go to qualified.com to learn more. Grant, are you ready? Yes. What do you do for fun? If you could see the shelf behind me, I try to collect tennis trophies. <laughs> I've got a tournament this weekend and I've been playing competitive tennis for a while and I just find it's not only great exercise physically, it's it's mentally challenging and it's kind of fun when you win. I've got another shot this weekend. If you could take any animal and make it any size, what animal would it be and what size would it be? I would just take a horse and I would just keep riding, riding it. And Maybe I'm somewhat influenced by, as we were talking about series, binge watching Yellowstone. The horse oh, segments are so cool. I didn't grow up with a horse. I did have summers on ranches and learn to ride, but I think they're just the right size. If I brought you back here one year from now, what's one thing or the biggest thing that has changed for marketing? I think we're sweating less because we're doing more predictable marketing. Like we've, oh, I'm always asked by board members and CEOs, what's going to be the outcome? Are we going to make the number? And I think we'll have the data and more tools to be able to predict that with a higher level of certainty. I don't know if you ever get to hundred percent. Otherwise I'd know the lotto numbers to pick. I think a year from now will be more predictable. Grant, I love it. Awesome chatting with you as always. Thanks again and take care. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks Ian. Bye now. <laughs>